Hi, this is Aisha and welcome to a new video of Reader Day Club. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the first volume of uh, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, that is Swan's Way. Now, uh, the plan is to read one volume every month. So, in the month of December, I reread Swan's Way. The first time I read this book, uh, it was, I think, in the beginning of this year. And next month, I will be reading the second volume, which is Within a Budding Grove. This will be my first time reading the second volume. Uh, so now instead of this video being in the general review format, I thought that I would just share a few couple of my favorite passages from the book and talk about them as a way of introducing you to the book. First, I quickly want to read what Nabokov uh, wrote about the whole of In Search of Lost Time. The whole, as in In Search of Lost Time, is a treasure hunt where the treasure is time and the hiding place the past. This is the inner meaning of the title, In Search of Lost Time. The transmutation of sensation into sentiment, the ebb and tide of memory, waves of emotion such as desire, jealousy and artistic euphoria. This is the material of the enormous and yet singularly light and translucid work. Now Nabokov also very accurately sums up the essence of In Search of Lost Time as being an evocation of the past that uses a wealth of metaphors and sentences that stretch to their utmost length and breadth. And it's true because Swan's Way is so delicately constructed but at the same time its sentences, you know, a single sentence takes up line after line, you know, never receding back. The enduring length of Bruce's sentences is profound in a sense as well as their endlessness. So just to give you an example of that, it's on page number four, I think. Yeah. For then I lost all sense of the place in which I had gone to sleep. And when I awoke in the middle of the night, not knowing where I was, I could not even be sure at first who I was. I had only the most rudimentary ex sense of existence, such as may lurk and flicker in the depths of an animal's consciousness. I was more destitute than the cave dweller, but then the memory, not yet of the place in which I was, but of various other places where I had lived and might now very possibly be, would come like a rope let down from heaven to draw me up out of the abyss of non-being, from which I could never have escaped by myself. In a flash I would traverse centuries of civilization, and out of a blurred glimpse of oil lamps, then of shirts with turned down collars, would gradually piece together the original components of my ego. And it ends with another sentence. Perhaps the immobility of the things that surround us is forced upon them by our conviction that they are themselves and not anything else, by the immobility of our own conception of them. So there is the exploration of the non-living uh, through the metaphors of death as well as just you know the beingness of everyday objects that we are all too familiar with. Now Swan's Way touches upon many themes but I think what it's most significantly about is enduring in the most poetic manner. Um, enduring feelings, sensations, emotions, thoughts and that are later manifested as memories. So enduring memories as a way of feeling connected to life. So the first half of the book uh, is focused on the narrator's bedroom and the various objects that are littered around his bedroom and how the room sort of interacts through its beingness with the narrator's life and his memories. So Proust uh, calls this his bedroom as my bedroom became the fixed point on which my melancholy and anxious thoughts were centered. So through this image of the narrator's bedroom, you go through several different epiphanies. This dim coolness of my room was to the broad daylight of the street what the shadow is to the sunbeam, that is to say equally luminous, and presented to my imagination the entire panorama of summer which my senses, if I had been out walking, could have tasted and enjoyed only piecemeal. So it was quite in harmony with my state of repose, which, thanks to the enlivening adventures related in my books, sustained, like a hand reposing motionless in a stream of running water, the shock and animation of a torrent of activity. And then my thoughts too formed a similar sort of recess. 
in the depths of which I felt that I could bury myself and remain invisible even while I looked at what went on outside. When I saw an external object, my consciousness that I was seeing it would remain between me and it, surrounding it with a thin spiritual border that prevented me from ever touching its substance directly, for it would somehow evaporate before I could make contact with it. Just as an incandescent body that is brought into proximity with something wet never actually touches its moisture, since it is always preceded by a zone of evaporation. Habit that skillful but slow-moving arranger who begins by letting our minds suffer for weeks on end in temporary quarters, but whom our minds are nonetheless only too happy to discover at last, for without it, reduced to their own devices, they would be powerless to make any room seem habitable. Now, Proust calls this the anesthetic effect of habit, how habit can become very quickly, it can become melancholic through when you uncover its relentless presence in our life, how it can brutally shape uh, an individual and even play a role in the action of an individual because so much of what we think and feel and say is, is, is it, it is a result of that and an extension uh, an externalization of uh, habit, even more so than we realize. Now, there's also the exploration of daily living and how deeply embedded it is in our psyche and how unconsciously it can stitch the fabric of an individual together out of nothing. And I think what Proust also puts focus on uh, is how we think how, how we think drives our perception of other people and even our presence in other people's lives. The book creates this space of self-consciousness where, you know, really well with the help of a character, I won't say who, but just the way the character feels like an outsider and feels like a spectator to his own life, I think. But then, even in the most insignificant details of our daily life, none of us can be said to constitute a material whole which is identical for everyone and need only be turned up like a page in an account book or the record of a will. Our social personality is a creation of the thoughts of other people. Even the simple act which we describe as seeing someone we know is to some extent an intellectual process. We pack the physical outline of the person we see with all the notions we already have formed about him. And in the total picture of him which we compose in our minds, those notions have certainly the principal place. Bruce writes in a way that feels as if people possess and can be perceived by more than just their physical bodies. The affectations and the descriptions of people in Swan's way feel very transcendental, as if they possess in themselves unique textures and scents that others perceive and internalize and remember, as if we remember more the sensations that people leave us with than the people themselves. There's also even the potency of opposing forces, of opposites simply, in the way that Proust describes objects, people and nature light and shadow, movement and stillness, sound and silence, being and non-being, in the immobility of things and the mobility of people, Proust awakens a very melancholic and profound sentiment. The philosophy of Marcel Proust is like a puzzle. It has many faces, it's contemplative and you cannot even attempt to solve the puzzle in a single reading. I realize this now because I've read Swan's Way twice and I'm still stumped by how intricate and labyrinthine this book is. But there is a philosophy to unearth here, there is wisdom, but it's very sentiment driven. I mean, his words are heavy with sentiment and emotion, so you probably will feel them more before you can fully understand them. I felt that I was not penetrating to the core of my impression, that something more lay behind that mobility, that luminosity, something which they seemed at once to contain as well as to conceal. Thus it is that most of our attempts to translate our innermost feelings do no more than relieve us of them by drawing them out in a blurred form which does not help us to identify them. There is an element of chance in these matters and a second chance occurrence, that of our own death, often prevents us from awaiting for any length of time the favours of the first. 
I feel that there is much to be said for the Celtic belief that the souls of those whom we have lost are held captive in some inferior being, in an animal, in a plant, in some inanimate object, and thus effectively lost to us until the day which to many never comes, when we happen to pass by the tree or to obtain possession of the object which forms their prison. Then they start and tremble, they call us by our name, and as soon as we have recognized them, the spell is broken. Delivered by us, they have overcome death and returned to share our life. And so it is with our own past. It is a labor in vain to attempt to recapture it. All the efforts of our intellect must prove futile. The past is hidden somewhere outside the realm, beyond the reach of intellect, in some material object, in the sensation which that material object will give us, of which we have no inkling. And it depends on chance whether or not we come upon this object before we ourselves must die. Memory is also a very important theme in the making of uh, Swan's Way, in what it's essentially about. And it comes up all the time. It's very sensually weaved together in the story that sort of takes on a both physical as well as a, a visceral form. And I'm going to leave you with one more passage uh, that is. Uh, about memory and just about reclaiming the essence of life lived most profoundly I think in memories than an actual reality but now and then his thoughts in their wandering course would come upon this memory where it lay unobserved would startle it into life thrust it forward into his consciousness and leave him aching with a sharp deep-rooted pain as though it were a bodily pain Swan's mind was powerless to elevate it but at least in the case of bodily pain, since it is independent of the mind, the mind can dwell upon it, can note that it has diminished, that it has momentarily ceased. But in this case, the mind, merely by recalling the pain, created it afresh. To determine not to think of it was to think of it still, to suffer from it still. And when, in conversation with his friends, he forgot about it, suddenly a word casually uttered would make him change countenance, like a wounded man when a clumsy hand has touched his aching limb. In a lot of ways, uh, Proust is a melancholic read, especially the first half of the book. The second half of the book mostly deals with the frivolous and, um, you know, the naive uh, nature, aspects of uh, human nature. It is also very humorous, but I think I enjoyed both halves in equal measure. I think uh, Proust's descriptions of people and the interactions that they have with each other feels so grounded and rooted and artistic, you know. So you read his metaphors as if you've lived them as memories. And that's one of the beautiful things about this book is, is that it can really transcend its literal format and it, it can really transport you into the world of memories and dreams and you know those metaphors they possess that unique and poetic and transcendental quality that is all for this video uh, thank you so much for watching and i hope that i have convinced you in uh, you know to read swan's way because i for the longest time did not pick up this book because i was just intimidated by its sheer volume and so many things that i have read about swan's way but now that i have read reread the first volume i it just feels like the most natural thing ever so yeah this is aisha from retail club and i'll see you guys next time